All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If you'll please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. We are going to pick up where we left off in our sermon series in the Gospel of John as we travel verse by verse through the Bible. Today, the title of our message is, you know, what is legal is not always acceptable. I know it's a long title, but I feel like it says a lot. What's legal is not always acceptable. Now, I don't think you need to be a deeply philosophical theologian to be able to point out examples of this in our current culture or in our recent history. So just some extreme examples. All right, let's say old Nazi Germany. It was legal to vandalize, to steal, and abuse your Jewish neighbor. And in fact, the government propaganda encouraged citizens to do it. Citizens would vandalize Jewish-owned businesses and steal from the Jews. They would abuse and mistreat their Jewish neighbors and even harass them and assault them. The law allowed it, so people with enough hate in their heart now had an excuse to mistreat other people. Now, they may have directed their hate in any direction if not given a clear option, but the government gave them permission to direct their hate in this particular direction, and so it created a culture of hate focused toward the Jews. This allowed for a slow escalation to a time when the government would now be allowed by its citizens to round up the Jews and segregate them from the rest of society, forcing them to live in ghettos. The government created what's now referred to as a snitch culture, so that any Jew who didn't voluntarily move into one of these ghettos would be told on by a Gentile neighbor, and the Gestapo would come to collect them. World history tells the rest of the story from there of the fate of the Jews. I think we all know what came next for them. Now, in the United States, we had an extreme racial issue of our own. At the same time in history, it was legal to segregate white people from anybody of color. And the black community especially was the target of racially directed hate. It was legal to discriminate openly. And in many communi communities, it was often encouraged to do it. This gave hateful people a target for the direction of their hate. Now, just as in Germany, the, the hate in their hearts could have gone in any direction if left unchanneled, but the law of the land gave them a legal outlet for their hate, which resulted in generational disparities that exist until even today. What is legal is not always acceptable. And while these might seem like some extreme examples, we could go on and on. Some more subtle examples. It's perfectly legal for you to get sloppy drunk. And in a lot of social circles, that's even encouraged, right? I mean, it's thought of as a, a rite of passage to some people. Now, I did some research, and no exaggeration, there are roughly 100 Bible verses directly commanding us to stay sober. And so you know what I always say, if the Bible says something once, we should pay attention. But if the Bible says something multiple times, we should invest heavily in, in that area of Scripture. So, if the Bible says something about 100 times, yeah, that should be a pretty big deal to us. Nevertheless, our sobriety um, is constantly under attack. Our society grants you permission to do something that God has clearly described to be hurtful for us. The legal allowance to get drunk or high in Colorado may seem like a lesser example than a legal allowance to abuse or discriminate against a person. But some would say the lesser example is worse in the long run. Because when it comes to the obvious mistreatment of people, the wicked leaders are only going to get away with that for so long, right? Because eventually people are going to stand up and protect and defend the people who cannot defend themselves. But when it comes to indulging in personal sin, those who love darkness unconditionally, right? John 3.19 talks about people who uh, are unconditionally in love with their sin. They love darkness or reject the light unconditionally. Uh, for those people, they will defend their sin as if their life depends on it. They will go to any lengths to excuse, justify, and defend that choice. So to allow for like a subtle amount of moral compromise in the laws of the land, you create a culture that condones or even promotes sin with roots that go deeper than any major offense would be allowed. In our text today, we're going to see how the religious leaders who oppose the ministry of God will use the law of the land as a weapon against Jesus Christ. They'll use government and politics to legally persecute the Christ. World history tells us that this is just the beginning because after the disciples of Christ would be labeled as Christians and spread the message of the gospel, their faith is going to be outlawed completely. It will be illegal for them to believe 
in there. Christians will then be legally rounded up, jailed, enslaved, and executed, sometimes in the most humiliating ways, such as during shows at Colosseum or in public executions where they're boiled alive. These are just some examples. The government would then create a snitch culture that encouraged the neighbors of the Christian to report any Christian meetings or Christian activity, encouraging the citizens and rewarding them for their participation in the snitching. Citizens would gather in stadiums and applaud as they indulge their hate by entertaining themselves with the humiliating torture and death of Christians for all to see. To further spread terror, if you become a Christian, this could happen to you. But that's getting a little ahead of our story today. So let's begin by reading our text together. We're going to start John chapter 18, verse 19. We're going to read through 24. Then we're going to skip to verse 28. Um, and the verses that we're skipping today, we did read last week. Because uh, you got to remember, this particular chapter has got two scenes happening at the same time. There's the, the storyline with Jesus in it, which we're talking about today. And then there's the storyline with Peter in it. And that's what we talked about last week. And John, as he tells it, he kind of cuts back and forth. Like, here's what's happening with one. He switches to here's what's happening with another, then cut scene back to the one. And uh, so for us to just stay consistent with our one storyline today, we're going to skip the verses we read last week and just um, move on. So it's, it says, John 18, starting in verse 19. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus said, I've spoken openly to the world. Jesus answered them, I've always taught in the synagogue. And in the temple complex where all the Jews congregate. And I haven't spoken anything in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who heard what I told them. Look, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the temple police standing by slapped Jesus saying, Is this the way that you answer the high priest? And Jesus said, If I have spoken wrongly, give evidence about what that was wrong. And if rightly, why do you hit me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now skip to um, chapter 18, verse 28. It says, Then they took Jesus to Caiaphas, to the governor's headquarters, or from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters, and it was early in the morning. They didn't enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. Then Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Uh, so Pilate told them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your own law. Well, it's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. And they said this so that Jesus' word might be fulfilled, signifying what sort of death he was going to die. So let's unpack what we just read there. Jesus has been sort of arrested secretly and taken to this place where, where a sort of pre-trial is happening. The religious leaders knew they had no real grounds for charging Jesus, so they tried to build evidence against him by using false witnesses. They're like, oh, you know, we arrested him. Just That should be enough for you to put him to death according to our sentencing guideline. They didn't want to give him the accusation. They knew they didn't really have a good one. And so they wanted to create these false witnesses to try to um, help their case. It'd be like today in our culture when an opponent of a person or opponent of a value decides to attack them by creating fake news. Fake news is the same thing as being a false witness, is creating lies that slander another person because the faker opposes them, but they can't find any legitimate grounds against them. These religious leaders are interrogating Jesus and they're slapping him around, trying to get him to speak out of line or trip him up in, in stress and pressure. They want him to say something, anything that they can use against him. And they haven't gotten anything yet. But we read about this same scenario in other gospel accounts. This is reported in all four gospels, so we get a bigger picture when we read it all together. And in one place, we're told about a false witness who uh, referenced the teaching of Jesus. See, Jesus prophetically predicted that the temple in Jerusalem was one day going to be torn down. And that um, did happen right after his death. It wasn't long that the temple would be destroyed, and it's still down today. It hasn't been rebuilt. Every other time it was taken out, it was rebuilt this time. It still hasn't been rebuilt. We know it will be rebuilt one day, but it's not rebuilt yet. So it's been thousands of years this temple's been down. And then Jesus, in this, he used this as a teaching moment when he prophesied this happening. He, he referenced himself as the temple of God, saying that he would be torn down and raised up again three days later, and he was predicting his death and resurrection. Now, this false witness took his words out of context, and 
and basically accused Jesus of trying to incite a riot against the temple that would result in the temple's attack and destruction. He said, Jesus is trying to get people to rip the temple down. No, that's not what Jesus said. But his literal words were being taken out of context and used against him. That's another common example of being a false witness, which is trying to use your opponent's words against them, trying to make a lie look like a truth, taking their what they did say and trying to make it sound like they said something else. So Jesus responds to this by saying, like, I've spoken openly in public. I've taught regularly in meeting places and in the temple where the Jews all come together. Everything I've done has been out in the open. He says, I've said nothing in secret. So why are you treating me like I'm some sort of secret conspirator? Question the people who've been listening to me. They'll tell you what I really said. My teachings have all been above board, he said. And when he said this, one of the, let's call them policemen standing there, slaps Jesus across the face. Like, how dare you talk to the chief priest like that? And, you know, in that setting, in that religious system, the chief priests or the high priests were, there was nobody above them but God. They, they were like the Pope to the Catholic. So Jesus replies, you know, if I've said something wrong, prove it. But if I've spoken plain truth, why are you slapping me around? Then they started shuffling Jesus from there to the chief priest's location and then to the governor's palace. And by the time he got there, it was early morning, our text says. Now, the Jewish leaders didn't want to go inside because that would disqualify them from eating the Passover supper. Remember the setting, right? This is all taking place before their big national religious festival, the Passover, which was a super big deal to the entire nation. Everybody came from all over. There's like a week long, a bunch of feasts. Everybody's together. It was a really big deal holiday. And by Jewish law, entering the house of a Gentile would make them ceremonially defiled, meaning they'd not be able to take place in the Jewish festivals. They'd have to like, spiritually quarantined while they isolated themselves from the rest of the people getting cleansed so that they, um, yeah, I don't know, it's just part of their ritual. But ironically, they were very strict about this particular area of their religious law while they were harboring murder and participating in treachery at the same time. And Jesus really hated hypocrites. I mean, I mean it. He got super upset whenever he saw people of spiritual influence acting in a way that was hypocritical. Whenever their life didn't match their words. And so integrity was important to Jesus. And integrity is important, I think, to everybody. I mean, we all feel this way. Like, if we see somebody whose life doesn't match their words, we respect them less. If there's somebody who says they're going to do something for you and doesn't follow through, you'll just respect them less. I didn't say forgive. I didn't say love. I said respect. You might love them and forgive them, and that's all fine. But still, you do kind of respect the person a little less whenever they regularly fail to... Um, live a life that matches their words. Well, Jesus felt the same way, but when it came to religious leaders, people who had spiritual influence over others, and their life didn't match their words, oh, he got super mad. All throughout the various Gospels, we see him lashing out aggressively at these leaders in his teaching. And at some points, he's literally yelling at them, calling, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites. And we know he's, he's, he's going off because there's exclamation points at the end of those sentences, calling, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites. So brood of vipers, that's like, you know, you, um, you know, nest of baby viper snakes. And what you want to understand about uh, a viper, uh, their eggs hatch inside the mother. So a uh, baby viper's first meal is its mother. They will eat their way out of the mom. The mom will die being eaten alive by her brood. And so it's terrible. That's a terrible way to go. And now remember the culture. I mean, people and places and things were unclean to the Jews. So if you touch this, you would be then unclean and would have to go and ceremonially isolate, you know, quarantine. And so, you know, to, to, to mistreat your mother would be like really unacceptable behavior. And so Jesus is talking to him. He's saying, you're not just a snake. You're the kind of snake that would eat your mother alive, like just kill her, just so that you could live. Like you're a brood of vipers and hypocrites. So he was really trying to, you know, hit them where it hurt. It was intended to be an offensive uh, insult. And he was mad whenever he said that. What we see as ironic, right, that, that one would be so legalistic about one area of their faith and yet completely disregard the vital matters of love and unity. We saw it ironic. Jesus got offended and was super angry. But anyway, in verse 29, it shows us that after the governor Pontius Pilate investigated this matter, he couldn't find any legit charges to bring against Jesus. Our text wraps up by saying that Pilate wanted to pass Jesus back to his accusers to deal with. But they said, hey, we're not allowed to kill anyone 
but we're not going to be satisfied until he is dead. So, that's what our text says. What can we learn from our text today? One thing that really jumps off the pages at me is this intense response to the conviction of sin. The religious leaders, see, they've seen and they've witnessed all the same miracles that the Jesus followers saw. I mean, they, they saw Jesus' work. They heard his teachings. They were there for it, too. And, and yet they responded very differently to how that made them feel. Anytime we have an encounter with Jesus, it's going to demand a response. His holiness and his power, they're going to inspire us. And, and that's going to lead to action in one direction or another. Either way, we're going to be responding to a feeling of conviction, usually a conviction about our sin. And when that happens, we're made to feel uncomfortable. That's the point. That's by design. That feeling of conviction, that uncomfortable in our conviction, is, is, is not one we're going to tolerate for very long. That's also by God's design. We're not going to live there for very long. The intention of the feeling of conviction is to lead you to repentance, right? So you would get rid of that uncomfortable feeling by you know, submitting to the will of God for your life and grow out of that immature behavior and experience forgiveness. That repentance is going to leave you cleansed and, and redeemed and set free in such a way that means the conviction has either saved you or grown you deeper. However, for some, such as those who love the darkness unconditionally and reject the light, as referred to in John 3, 19, instead of them rejecting the sin, they are going to reject the presence of the holiness that convicted them. They intend to live in their sin. But again, since the uncomfortable feeling of conviction is intolerable, they got to respond, right? And they do so in a way that further separates them from relationship with God. They purge the things from their life that brings them to that state of conviction. So they don't want to spend time with Christians. They don't want to be exposed to Christian teaching. And so, you know, they'll they'll often blame us like we're some sort of sin detectors. Like, like you know, the, the, they'll confuse conviction for judgment. Just being around us, I feel judged, I feel attacked. But we didn't say anything. We're not judging you. We love you. We're, you know, our job's not to judge. Our job is to love, and God's going to sort it all out later. We're just here to love. But still, people, like they experience the presence of God in us when they're around us, and they get uncomfortable, and they confuse that for judgment, and they blame us for how they feel so uncomfortable about their choices. And uh, and so they will just reject being around Christians or Christian teaching so that they don't have to be uncomfortable in their conviction. Or maybe the convicted will deny truth on such a prideful level so deep that they can believe their excuses and their justifications to the point that They'll sit in a church service every single week hearing truth and never be changed. Such was the case of the Pharisees, right? They were in church every single weekend. They saw the miracles of Jesus. They heard his teaching. But when they were convicted of sin, they oppressed the ministry of God. we got to remember, it's not our knowledge of Jesus Christ that saved. Because if knowing truth about Jesus was all it took, well then, uh, Judas would have been just as saved as Peter. Now, the devil is the greatest theologian. He knows a lot of truth about God. The Pharisees, they intimately knew the scriptures, the word of God. And, you know, Judas and Peter, we compared them last week, right? Judas and Peter both betrayed Jesus that night, but Peter repented and was saved, while Judas dug into his sin and was condemned. While most of us are not as much like the religious leaders, we are all like the disciples, because at one point or another, We've all been guilty of denying Jesus as our Lord in a vital area of life. Maybe keeping our identity as Christians a secret during times of pressure. Or maybe we're living like the people of earth while claiming to be a child of God, which shows the world that the word has no authority in our life. We see that Judas had all the same knowledge as the other apostles. He saw the same miracles. He heard the same teaching. He walked with Jesus. He had the so he had the best pastor, the best leader, right? And we know that he behaved in such a way that was so consistent with the believers in his group that they were surprised when he was exposed as a traitor to their faith. So he had the behavior, he had the knowledge, but his knowledge did nothing for him because his heart was hard with sin, and his pride convinced him that he was justified in his uh, betrayal. Same as the Pharisees. You know, they, they, they also just were so beaten down by pride that they couldn't see the truth himself staring them in the face. 
Which brings me to my second point, another lesson we can learn from our text today. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Did Judas or the Pharisees do anything wrong in their storyline in this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, did Judas or the Pharisees do anything illegal during their storyline? No, clearly not. In fact, Judas got paid and applauded by people highly esteemed in society for his role. It would seem that legal is not the same thing as morally acceptable. In our world today, it seems like people would like to define morality as a flexible thing that bends in whatever direction their behavior does. So if I'm going to behave in this way, then I believe morality bends in that way, of course. So if I desire to sleep with whoever I want, then I can apply a moral standard that says, why not? Hey, I'm free to live however way I want, as long as I'm not hurting anybody. Or if I want to drink as much alcohol as I want, I could apply a moral standard that says, you know, it's what I want, and I've got to be true to myself. Or maybe we've heard it said, you know, do what makes you happy, because that's the point of life. Nobody has the right to tell me what's wrong for me. I'm free. And all of these relative moral positions appeal very much to our sinful nature because they give us permission to do what our flesh craves, especially if it's legal. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. So just because it's legal doesn't mean it's helpful. Now Jesus said over and over that we have to deny ourselves and follow him or we cannot be his disciples. He said it over and over and over again. Matthew 10, 38, Matthew 6, 24, Mark 8, 34, Luke 9, 23, Luke 14, 27. Five times he says, you cannot be his disciple unless you deny yourself and follow him. So five times, over, and five out of four gospels, he says this. Now, you know what I say, right? I've said it before. If the Bible says something one time, we better pay attention. But if it says something multiple times, we better really uh, invest. Just because I can do some things doesn't mean I should do those things. Just because it's legal to get drunk or high doesn't mean it's helpful for me. Just because it's legal to have sex with whoever I want doesn't mean it's helpful to me. There's no law against skipping church on Sundays. That doesn't mean it's helpful to do it. And with just these few examples, I mean, we're even encouraged by our society to do these legal things that we know are spiritually detrimental. We humans cannot be the starting point for the standard of morality because we, you know, just don't have what it takes to even identify it well, let alone define it. Imagine if everybody on earth were allowed to make their own scales to decide how much something weighs. We all just decide for ourselves how much a gram or a pound weighs. And so we'll, we'll find out pretty quickly that one merchant, while they're um, selling, decided a pound would be less, and when they're buying, that a pound would be more. Or even if everybody did their best to be on that same page, there'd still be literally no way for us all to come up with the same amount per pound on our best day. We need a standard of measurement that, that we're all talking about the same thing at the same time when we reference a unit of weight. This logic applies universally. For some reason, people choose to not apply it to matters of morality. We uh, want to be all on the same page when we talk about things like for example, how much money is in your bank account, right? I don't want to go to my banker and hear them say that I've got a lot less in my balance than my checkbook says I should. And then him say, well, you know, what truth is relative, man? You've got your truth, I've got mine. And my truth says you don't have any money anymore. Like, no, that's just not how it works. We, I want my banker and I to agree on the number based on a standard that applies universally. When it comes to morality, we're unqualified to set that standard, right? Because if you were blind, all your life, could you describe what light looks like? Or what if you are in a room full of people who are also blind uh, all their life? Could you guys come up with a conclusion together with, with all the philosophical understanding and dictionary definitions? Could you do well to understand what light looks like? Genesis 8.21 says, For the man, the intentions of his heart is evil from youth. So from youth, we are just corrupt. And, and it doesn't take a, a deeply philosophical theologian to figure that out either. Really, all you got to do is be a parent. If you ever worked with kids, you know, you didn't have to teach them how to lie. You had to teach them how to tell the truth. And you didn't have to teach them how to steal. You had to teach them how to share because doing the wrong thing came very naturally 
to every one of your kids. It'd be like us trying to make a telescope without being able to see. We would never know the quality of the product that we've made. We don't know if it's great or if it's terrible because we're unqualified to look through it. We could call it amazing. And if everybody else in the room is just as blind, how are they to say any different? Well, this guy said it was great. And that's all I've got to go on. And it feels good to me. And so what are we going to do? We might as well just say it's a great telescope. I mean, well, who can tell you any different? With the standard of morality, we do have a true north on our compass. We do have a plumb line that's certain. And that's the morality standard of God. Now, I know this morality standard is unpopular because, you know, he's holy and perfect. And it opposes some of the things that are natural and in our sinful body's desire. Nevertheless, whether we like it or not, God's standard is the standard of righteousness, right? Whether I like it or not, a pound is a pound. And I might step on the scale and look down, and I might want to disagree that a pound is a pound anymore. But it is what it is, whether I like it or not, and especially whether I like what it reveals about me or not. A pound is still a pound. It's not a flexible or relative thing or different for everybody. When we're confronted with the holy moral standard of God, it's going to convict, just like it convicts me. Whenever I look at the number on the scale, it's going to convict. That's the point of looking. Now, one side of us realizes the wrath of God is uh, such a real thing, right? That justice will be served for all those who have chosen an affair with darkness as opposed to a life in the light. We see that from cover to cover in the Bible, uh, it talks a lot more about uh, a time describing the wrath and justice of God, and especially for those who are not one of his disciples. Even in the New Testament, yeah, this is not just an Old Testament thing. This is a from cover to cover deal. I mean, almost the whole book of Revelation is dedicated to describing the wrath of God and the lack of repentance for those who are confronted with it. The teachings of Jesus Christ in the Gospels describe in detail things like the resurrection of the condemned, what hell is like, and the fate of those who stand against his ministry, especially for those who claim to belong to him but are faking. And so it's all there. And it's all true, which is why the person who is deeply in love with sin is going to do anything they can to avoid the feeling of conviction in Christ. They will oppress and censor us at every opportunity. I mean, think about Jesus in our text, right? Being silenced during a speedy and false trial. Do you think they wanted to censor him because they really believed he was wrong or because they were afraid of his message? I mean, think about it. What if the cops came in here right now and they arrested me for preaching this sermon today? What if they took down our website and shut down our YouTube channel and put me in solitary confinement where I couldn't speak to anybody under charges related to today's sermon? What would that tell you about the message? Would it tell you that I'm spreading lies or that they are afraid of the content of the message? That sort of censorship is funny because it reveals the heart of the one censoring and it affirms the message of the censor. It's clear that we will respond to conviction one way or the other. We're going to get convicted when confronted with the holiness of Christ. That's going to make us act. We'll either respond by justifying our behavior, saying, who am I hurting? And it's legal anyway, diving deeper and deeper into a hard heart. Having knowledge and maybe even spending a lot of time with Christians, even looking just like one as Judas did. Or we will repent and submit to the life of Christ and the, and the will of God for our life. And in that, we are not restrained from living, but we're set free to begin to finally live, and that life will last forever. I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.